Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to another week of our spread uh, election 2020 events. Um, today, we are covering Proposition 25, which is a referendum on cash bail here in California. The background information is that when you are arrested by the law enforcement agency for a crime, some people, when I say some, I mean people without a you know history of avoiding court dates or about a history of um, violent offenses, for example, accused of some crimes. And by some crimes, I mean nonviolent crimes, you know, nothing crazy. Those people accused of those crimes have the chance to be released before their trial date, which can actually take many months and even years before being scheduled. Some people of, of this population are released for free while others have to um, pay, pay bail money. In most of California prior to 2018, release on money bail to the courts and then returned to the accused person at the time of the trial in order to ensure that people show up to court. So if you pay the bill and you get out free, but you leave the country or whatever, you don't get that money back or you miss your court date, you don't get your money back. So that's the idea behind bail. Um, if you can't afford that bail amount, uh, often you would borrow from a bail bond company. Um, you might have heard commercials for Aladdin bail bonds or something. And then, but you are subsequently charged a fee for that loan and it's around 10%. Um, in California, this industry is actually regulated by the state, which is nice to hear. Um, but so this is expensive because even that 10% of that bill amount is a considerable sum, right? You've heard of uh, bill amounts are, you know, they can range anywhere from, you know, 10,000 to the millions of dollars if you are, you know, just to give you, um, that incentive to come back to court to get your money back. Arraignment is the first court hearing that happens after your arrest where the accused is notified of the charges against them and appointed um, defense counsel. In 2018, a law was signed by the California legislature and the governor that would replace the money bill system with a risk assessment system. This law would not go into effect unless this referendum right here passes. Any questions on the background info? Wait, so uh, this risk assessment system, is it like if they think you're a risk per risky person who will flee the county or the city, then they're going to implement the bunny bill? But if, you, if they think that you're gonna stay where you are and you're gonna come to court when you're told to, then they won't implement this money bail system? Um, so there will, there will no longer be any more money bail if this passes. You will either be able to go back home before your trial or you will be detained. Okay, got it. Um, next slide. So what, what would this do? Um, this would enact that bill that I uh, mentioned uh, that passed in 2018. This will eliminate release on bail. It creates new processes for uh, being released before arraignment. Um, it will automatically release most people um, for most misdemeanors, which are you know, less serious crimes. Releases for felonies and some misdemeanors will require the risk assessment. Risk assessment requires uh, the, a court to collect um, information, whatever they need to make their decision, using risk calculation tools or software, um, computer programs or formulas, and or um, staff and judge um, judgments, essentially. And if you are released, um, you may be subject to certain conditions, such as checking in, you know, making sure you're still in the county, whatever, uh, whatever conditions the court puts on. Trial courts will be responsible for pretrial assessment. Um, this just means that uh, which courts are going to be responsible for this. So for the question of being released at, at or after arraignment, 
Um, people are generally released for free at arraignment, apparently. Um, uh, but district attorneys can request hearings to continue to detain you. And people will only be detained in certain circumstances if the prosecution can, you know, make the case that you are a flight risk or you will harm more people in the future. <clears throat> uh, the fiscal impact is that uh, increased cost to the government it will vary depending on interpretation of law and how many individuals will be released. We can expect a, a really big a workload increase in the courts. Um, it will, there will be some costs to supervise some of the individuals that are released. And the guess is that it will cost uh, mid hundreds of millions annually. However, there will be a decreased cost to the government uh, because there will be um, a lot less jail jailed individuals. Yeah. So voting yes would money bill no longer be a thing in California. And voting no would mean um, that bill, that law will not go into effect. However, I should mention that I believe in San Francisco, we no longer do money bill, but this is a statewide thing. Arguments in favor. So this the argument says that voting yes will mean more equitable justice system. Uh, innocent people have sat in jails waiting, awaiting their trials for years. And in fact, almost 5,000 people in America have died before being convicted in the years between 2008 and 2019 based on reporting by Reuters uh, before being convicted in a court of law because they did not have the means or, or uh, uh, to post bail, or they weren't given given the offer. Thousands more are traumatized and dehumanized in jail systems. Speedy trials are a myth in the current justice system. Another factor is that racial makeup of jail populations are disproportionate, does not reflect the actual population. It affects certain populations more than others. Rich people have enough liquid cash to, uh, in, in essence, buy their freedom before their trial, creating two vastly different systems of justice. So the argument is that, um, you know, wealth should not be a factor in justice, right? If we try to have a blind and equal justice for every person. The second argument in favor is that this is a, a more scientific analysis um, of risk assessments as opposed to a question of money or individual judges um, judgment, which are of course um, liable uh, to biases. So using algorithms, formulas and tools that determine risk um, as opposed to simply money bail seems to make more sense, it's more blind, it's more, seems to be more fair, it's more standardized. Um, and there are different types of systems. I, I don't have all the details about the exact risk assessment tools, there's different kinds. You know, some, you know, some are, you know, they're all quantifiable, meaning like if you, you know, if you skip the court date in the past, you'll get like 50 points or something. And then, you know, over a threshold, it'll be a yes or no, whether you're allowed to, to go home. Uh, the third argument in favor is that it'll reduce the jail population, which is uh, a good thing for proponents because American jails are horrible, traumatic, and inhumane. And in fact, once you go to jail, you are uh, much more likely to commit uh, more crimes and worse crimes, be radicalized um, racially, among other things. It will destroy lives. It costs the public a lot of money, and it's arguably a human rights violation, especially if you keep in mind that these are people that have not been convicted. They're simply accused, but we're holding them in these, these ways. Okay, arguments against this proposition. Uh, uh, yes. Um, so if we go back to argument one, is these like rich people. So they can, I mean, if you have enough money, you can pay your bail and then 
basically you don't have to sit in jail anymore, but you still have to go to court. Yes. Yeah, that. But if you don't have the money to pay, then you have to sit in jail until your trial. Yeah. Yeah, it's crazy the amount of time that um, some people have to sit in jail waiting, waiting trial. Some people come out, you know, completely messed up. That sucks. Um, okay, arguments against this. Uh, so this is an argument against the uh, risk assessment um, program. Um, says it has problems of its own. Um, it may be discriminatory. Um, you know, it may be imperfect, right? Because it's, it's just a, a formula. And so this is uh, one of the, the main concerns against using that system. Um, next, we'll go into, we'll, we'll get into some more detail here as well um, when we get into the discussion. Argument number two, says that zero bail leads to more criminals on the street. And I read somewhere, it says that California had a zero bail policy during the pandemic because we didn't want uh, crowding of the jails while there was a pandemic. Which meant that people, they pretty much were using that new system. So uh, apparently during this time, individuals were being arrested multiple times in a single day committing more crimes than they would have if they weren't immediately released. So this is an argument for public safety and suggesting that simply holding people is not the worst thing, especially if they are accused of a crime. So there's that. The next argument is argument number three. This will increase operating costs for our courts and our justice department. It will make the courts move slower and increase the workload of all the attorneys and all the judges because they have to determine uh, the risk assessment of every individual. They have to collect information that you know might come from a lot of sources. They might have to do interviews, maybe if they need to, if they need that to make their judgment. And so this says that this might even uh, increase the time between arrest and uh, trial simply because the courts have a lot more things to wade through um, before they can move their case along. And, and again, based on the risk assessment, some individuals who are accused will not, are not gonna be released because they have found to be a risk. And those people will be detained until they get to trial. This time might increase and those individuals might be radicalized or, and what have you, you know, harmed by the jail system. And so if, if this increases that time, uh, critics say we should not do it. So that is the end of the um, slides here for this proposition. What are people's thoughts? And let's see if I can quickly Google any of these risk assessment stuff. Um, I think I'm going to vote a yes on this. I think uh, the arguments that we went through there they're good. They're like a good question. Like argument one, it makes me think. Argument one is software-based risk assessment leads to problems and it's discriminatory. And it, it just makes me wonder, okay, so what is the risk assessment system? And like Bowdoin said, who's designing it? But I think we can create a risk assessment system that's not discriminatory. I think computers are very powerful. And if you design it right, if you create the system or the rubric right, you can make it so that it's not discriminatory. So I don't know if I, I mean, I feel like that argument is valid, but at the same time, I feel like we can take precautions and to make a risk assessment system that is fair.
Yeah, um, I guess a common, a common viewpoint on the the notion that um, these risk assessment systems are discriminatory. Right. For example, if the risk assessment software spits out um, and you see the stats and it, it says that, you know, more Asian people are risk as opposed to Mexican people or something like that. And the idea that um, that's racist, some people might question that and say, you know, what if it's just true that you know, more of those agents being assessed have a greater rap sheet, for example. So, so that was a, that was a kind of like a tangent to Carmen's a point. A greater what sheet? A greater criminal history. Wait, but I guess I guess my concern is when I when I hear that I'm thinking, wait, when you're if you're designing a risk assessment software program, uh -huh. why is race being inputted into the software program to begin with? Because right. aren't you assessing the crime itself? Exactly. Um, so race might not be anywhere near the formulas in that software program. Program says, you know, um, out of out of a hundred, out of a hundred people it assessed, the uh, fifty of them were black and fifty of them were white, and out of that the the black population, it said that 37 were risks to society and they should be detained further. While in the white population, it only said 25 were risks. So, I, you know, that's a, and then pe people are gonna say, you know, hey, that system or that formula is racist. When in fact the, the and the other side will say, no, that's just how it was. So I was just saying, um, I was just commenting on um, that that potential criticism of risk assessment softwares. I see. Yeah. But sorry, that was kind of a tangent to, to Carmen's point. Carmen's point was more of the idea that even though it's maybe it might be flawed, but it, it could eventually be fixed. And I think I'm I'm pretty sure I don't know for sure, but it's not just follow what the computer says. I'm pretty sure humans review the numbers and judges right. have to sign off on it. I, I would I would hope so. But yeah, that makes that more sense in my head too. But yeah, so I like, voted yes on this too. Um, uh -huh. and, and mainly for the first argument, like I didn't even, like just making the cr criminal justice system more equitable just makes more sense. Like just because you have more money doesn't mean you, sh you should deserve, you have any more leverage than someone that doesn't have more money, right? So. Uh -huh. That's the whole point of why I voted yes. I, I think I'm leaning towards no on this because um, I think if you get rid of bail, it leads, not that I'm saying that it's 100% guaranteed, but there's a possibility of corruption because those that are rich that get pulled over for whatever reason can pay it off to their cops um, because if they know that there's no bail, that once they get into the station, it's kind of over. So it leads to that kind of gray area from wherever they're caught to the police station. Um, secondly, I think that, you know, there's there's gonna be more, you know, like not, not criminals, but those that commit misdemeanors or felonies that are gonna be released if they don't fit into this algorithm. And that just gives them opportunities to recommit the same crime. And if you can stop it, then why not? Um, Another thing is just because there's less people in jail doesn't mean it's exactly better for us because of the contracts that we have with these prisons, these private prisons. If we don't meet a certain quota, the, the, the state has to pay these private corporations money anyway. So it's almost like a lose-lose situation in terms of money. Um, and lastly, I think if, if um, they might not consider race into this algorithm but if they if the computer algorithm reads last names and starts to build off that as their kind of like their determining factor of who commits crimes then it's almost kind of the same thing where if there's no bail then the poor people would just have to sit um in you know holding until you know years months until their their court date and it's, it doesn't really solve anything um if anything it 
I don't know. I feel like it holds more people into a pig pen more than it would release them. Mm. Yeah. And once again, the money, the money, uh, the money problem is also a thing. Like they, like if you have the money to get out of it, there's going to be a way to get out of it. Wait, can you um, repeat your the money? So, so my, my money thing is, this is just like a hypothetical, of course, I'm uh -huh. not saying that everyone's kind of corrupt like this, but like, for example, if you, if you get stopped for DUI, right, um, if you can, if you can get into the, uh, the, the precinct, um, there's a, there's a possibility that you can post bail if you're rich. I'm not saying that you'll get out of the, the court date, but you can post bail. But if there's no possibility of bail at all, there's a possibility that you can tell the police officer, hey, if this, if we can just say that this doesn't happen and I pay you something up front, then can I go? Oh, so you're saying that the person who has the DUI is going to bribe that police officer and say, I'll give you this stash of money if you just let me go right now and then we'll pretend like nothing nothing happened yeah because i mean this is obviously like a like a fairy tale like hypothetical because i'm not saying that everyone that has money is going to do this but um it's just that if you post bail there's government record on where that money came from and where it goes but if bail is gone um then people are you know they're going to find ways of trying to get out of i guess being in trouble Because they know that. But, you, but doesn't like a police officer, if they think someone's drunk driving, they'll like pull the guy over and then they'll like, won't they record? They'll pull the guy over and then record like the license plate and whatever. Like, no, wait, how does it work? So like, they're just like, oh, give me your, they'll, they'll record the license plate before they even get out of the car to go talk to the guy, right? I, I would uh, I would hope so, but um, I mean, there's plenty of cases where you know dash cam footage is gone, body cam footage conveniently turns off, um, and you know I guess like if that was the case, then you would have to have probable cause before you take down any records. But if there's if that guy is just kind of I don't know sleeping behind the wheel, would you still take his records? I mean, it's not a DUI. I mean, it's, you're still driving recklessly. Don't get me wrong, but like. It, like, you know, if it's treated the same way, then, you know, would you get out of it? I don't know. I mean, I feel like there are those, those cases where maybe a police officer is just going to pretend like it didn't yeah. happen. But I feel like the majority of people who get pulled over for drunk driving will probably get I mean, something on their record, right? And hopefully, all of them get. Like you're, I feel like you're talking about fringe cases. Yeah, like like I said, it's a like hypothetical what ifs, but you know, like, but you know, I, I hope that preferential, um, you know, treatment is not a case if bail is gone, because you mm. know, preferential treatment aside, you know, whether whether if it's if bail is still there, even if they're an actor or someone that you like, if they're going into jail, they can post bail. Then they, they know they can get out of it either way. Either you treat them like extra nice with like special treatment or not, they can get out of it. They know that. But without bail, it doesn't, you know, like then it, it's just either, either it's, it's a corrupt system either way if they still give preferential treatment when this bail is gone. But what do you think about those innocent people who can't post bail so they have to sit in jail to wait? for their trial and sometimes it takes so long that they come out and they're like okay well i don't have a job anymore because i had to sit in jail and wait for my trial and my life is over because um i mean it's it's kind of a contradictory statement if they're innocent and in jail at the same time isn't it mm, not necessarily because um cop the cop's job is to arrest you based on proper co probable cause mm -hmm. And I don't know if you've heard the phrase, uh, fuck, I forgot what it was. You could beat the, uh, it was a cool sounding phrase. Basically, you could beat the charge, but you can't beat the ride. 
meaning they'll take you for a spin. You know, they'll they'll impound your car, whatever. They'll come up with whatever they want to mess with you if you mm-hmm. give them a hard time. Because it's not their job to determine whether you're guilty or innocent. Mm-hmm. It's their job to um, take you in based on probable cause, give the give the evidence, and then the justice system takes care of it. You know, that case gets assigned a prosecutor, and the prosecutor is the one that says, hey, I think this guy's guilty because such and such. And the issue that people are bringing up is that, um, and I'll link this uh, Reuters reporting, uh, that the time it takes from when you go into a jail cell to sitting down in front of a, you know people in suits saying that, hey, he's guilty, hey, he's not, uh, this time is, is uh, you know, too much. Okay. Yeah. So I would definitely, uh, I'll chime in on this conversation too. Uh, I would, I definitely would concede the point to Andy about if there were no cash bail, the incentive to bribe the cop may increase. So I would concede that point, um, but I would address uh, all the other things that, that's going on with this proposition. Um, but I actually forgot a lot of the points that, that Andy brought up. Um, there was one where I think you mentioned, I forgot. Can you uh, remind us, Andy? Oh, I was just saying it's like bribery is an option. Um, if we don't fill the prisons with enough people, we lose money anyway because of the problems oh, okay. we have with the private prisons. Can I? Yeah, go for it. Uh, share my view on that, that note. It's private companies' money anyways. Obviously, it's ideal if we don't pay them anything at all. Um, but if we had to, I would rather pay them the amount while not uh, keeping people in jail who are not huge risk to the community. Oh yeah, of course. I mean, I, I'm not, I'm not for holding innocent people for you know ungodly amount of time, even if they're innocent. It's just like one of those like possible things that will take this like i'm just thinking about the fiscal impacts in, on both sides i'm not saying like oh we should hold people that like might have stole a candy bar because that would be stupid so for you that point about having to pay those companies anyways that's not an argument um this, that that doesn't push you a certain way right that's just yeah. a fact it's, it's, yeah it's just a fiscal it's fiscal impact that i mean like and if you're thinking about like if this would cost the state any more money or you know give us any more money it's just one of those things to keep in mind yeah so you're not suggesting that that fact should push someone one way or the other on this proposition oh no because i mean like no one no one even thinks about that kind of money like it's it happens regardless behind the scenes even now no one thinks about that kind of money so it shouldn't it it shouldn't sway anyone either either way to think about that Mm -hmm. i would take I, i would take that fact and sway them in favor of this because you're maybe you're not saving money but what you're saving is a lot of suffering yeah so and and maybe someone could swing it the other way and take that fact and make an argument against the the proposition um so uh did uh you had you had a couple other points i don't know if you if you remember them too but i should have wrote them down Oh, it's okay. I mean, I think that's, I think that's about it. I was just kind of like thinking through like what the fiscal impacts are, like Uh if it's a good reason or not. Um, Well, another point is like, if it's not serious enough to uh, keep them in jail or in the holding, then, you know, it gives a possibility of recommitting the crime. Uh Um, Another thing is um, if race is not input into the system, the computer might start taking last names as an indicator of and then that could possibly lead to biases in the computer. Mm. Yeah, I'll go ahead, Carmen. Is that under the assumption that they're gonna be using like AI software that says like, oh, okay, like find me a link, AI. And then the AI is just gonna be like, oh yeah, there's mm-hmm. a lot of people with this last name that's committing a lot of crime. So we're gonna we're gonna make a note of that when we do this risk assessment. Kind of, kind of. It might sound silly, but kind of. Because I, I mean, see. like, I mean, you wouldn't let a human do it because humans have human error, and you know, we have personal biases that we're not even aware of. So I would assume that you're feeding it through an AI algorithm. 
So, I mean, if somebody showed you a software that explicitly doesn't use AI, you know, it doesn't connect the previous uh, iteration of the program to the next iteration that you're running, mm -hmm. would that be enough to, you know, soften you on this point on your mistrust, for example? Then it would, it would shrink the sample size significantly. I mean, like the point of algorithms is to learn off past examples, isn't it? Right, and, and what if, uh, you know, what if I'm the guy, you know, in charge of procuring the software for uh, San Francisco County, for example, right? Mm -hmm. What if in my um, requirements for this contract is I need to see your software, I need to see every line of code, and I need to see that you, you're not using AI, you're not connecting this iteration with the previous iteration. Instead, we go line by line and it says, you know, if you have, you know, however many misdemeanors in your in your history, that's however many points. And then, you know, point being that every iteration is- uh, Independent you... of the past one. Exactly. Okay. Would that soften you on this? Oh yeah, definitely. As long as, as, long as biases cannot be learned, then I, I'm, I'm on board. Cool. Um, on the point of uh, individuals recommitting misdemeanors, um, does it, I mean, does it make you feel better if, well, first of all, these are misdemeanors. They're not, uh, they're, they're nonviolent. Um, let's say they steal, let's say they steal like a freaking portable speaker from Best Buy. Buy, right? They get, they get, you know, maybe they already sold it or whatever. They made like 200 bucks. So they get arrested, but they have no record. So based on the system, they're going to be released. Let's say they go back to the same Best Buy and they steal something else. And so this is one of your concerns that individuals are recommitting crimes um, because when they should have just been in jail for the whole time. Um, yeah, and I mean, so, like, isn't the cap nine hundred dollars now for stealing misdemeanor like theft? And yeah, if the, if that thing passes, the other one. Yeah, the, yeah. So if the other one passes, then it's nine hundred dollars. And nonviolent crimes include trafficking of people and goods, and also domestic violence. Mm -hmm. So, like, if you're letting um, if you're letting someone that commits domestic violence off over and over again because it's considered a misdemeanor, that's a no-no. <laughs> well, at least in my opinion, that's a no-no. And and the uh, the assumption here is that um, that is the case that people are committing uh, really bad misdemeanors and they're going to recommit them. Do you have faith, because uh, we don't have the details of the risk assessment software, do you have faith in, in the software that, for example, after the second misdemeanor, obviously that changes the calculation because it's in your history. Right. And I mean, do you have faith in the system where, you know, it does count your history and after maybe three misdemeanors, you're no longer oh, yeah. be able to come out? Oh yeah, definitely. It definitely depends on the threshold. It depends on how much they, how much they weight each different kind of misdemeanor. Uh -huh. um, but it also matters in, you know, for example, domestic violence is a huge one because, you know, personally, it's a sore spot. Like, it's like, I hate scumbags to get away with it. Um, the victims of domestic violence usually are too, sh too scared to report in the first place. So it's very rare that they get caught. Mm -hmm. So if they were to get caught um, and let go, obviously for the victim, it's going to be severely worse the next time around. Mm -hmm. And if it takes three times to get caught and, until they even like consider it a real case, then that would suck. Mm. Now, I don't know enough about the law to say whether there's a distinction between violent um, domestic domestic abuse or something uh -huh. versus nonviolent domestic abuse. And I don't even think nonviolent domestic abuse is ever, you know, people don't get arrested for that, I don't think. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it depends on if the other prop gets passed as well. But your current, uh, currently you don't have much faith in this and any uh, risk assessment software in um, keeping domestic violence people. We're well, not just domestic violence, just, yeah. just misdemeanors in general. It's just domestic violence because I learned that it's not considered a violent crime. It just sticks out. It just kind of sticks out. Mm. Yeah. And that, that's you know, with new technology. I feel like you know, once once it adapts, once the enough iterations are out, it's pretty solid. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
but as of right now you're not you're not convinced by these uh as of risk right assessments now, yeah, yeah i'm not not too convinced hmm. All right, let's uh, anyone have closing thoughts on, on this proposition? If not, we're going to move along to our final proposition of the evening.